NFL owner Shad Khan calls out his fellow owners. Michael Jordan isn't happy with the present state of the NBA. Richard Sherman to the rescue. The NBA and Nike connect. Joel Embiid exploits a net's weakness. And who and what are off topic this week. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports, coming right up. Welcome and thanks for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you as always. You too, Keisha. And it's great to see you, our friends at home. And we are really excited because this is the 100th episode of What's the 401 Sports. And we'd like to thank you for being with us on this journey to 100 and doing us many, many more episodes together. We have so much to talk about, so we're just going to jump right in and talk about the NFL. Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, sent a letter to the 32 NFL owners and club presidents informing them that the discussions about the national anthem will be on the agenda for the, this fall's meeting. It appears as though Goodell is trying to turn the page on players kneeling during the national anthem. Mike, do you think that Roger Goodell is up for this task? I hope so. I think he certainly has his work cut out for him. Let's face it. I mean, there has been not many people in the sports world that, has had, that have had as much bad publicity over the course of the last 10 years as Roger Goodell had. I mean, the, 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 character assassination, the character assassination attempts on him have been so bad that his wife has started her own Twitter page where she's gone <laughs> after some of his critics. Uh, this is not going to be easy, and I think what the NFL is doing now, where they had their meeting on Tuesday of this past week, where they met with players, sort of trying to figure out what they can do to move forward with these protests, I think it's not going to be, this is going to be very difficult for Roger Goodell. He's made so many mistakes, we all know this in the time that he's been commissioner, from Bounty Gate to Spy Gate to the Flake Gate to the Ray Rice situation, but this is an opportunity for himself to really bring this league together. And I think a lot of that starts with the players. People want to keep talking about Cornell, they want to talk about the owners, but the real thing for me is this is the players' league. And I think that despite all the crazy stuff that's happened over the course of the last several weeks with Donald Trump and his comments and everything, there is without a doubt a united front amongst the players in this league. I think that that's something that Roger Goodell has to feed off of as they move forward with whatever happens in the near future. Yeah, good. Goodell is in a really precarious position because his bosses are the 32 owners of the NFL teams and he needs to appease them, but there's a human aspect to this in the players and you, he also needs to make policies and do things that are also serve their best interests. And I think, like you, I'm a little bit wary of if if Roger Goodell is the person that can do it, but this is something that could really cement his legacy. He's had a lot of missteps over the course of the years, especially with some big issues, as you mentioned, domestic violence. So if he gets this right, it could be something that, you know, will turn his legacy around for him. And I think he sh is showing signs that he gets it because um, I did read part of the letter that was posted by Adam Schefter, and in it he did Roger Goodell dis discusses that it's time to really start having discussions about the real issues. And I, and I mentioned before on previous shows, I feel as though the, the initial reasonings for the protest has gotten lost and diluted it with talks of patriotism. And then even from the player's standpoint, me trying to figure out why they all of a sudden had this widespread kneeling and it seems to be more of a reaction to what Donald Trump said instead of the actual issues that really prompted Colin Kaepernick to start his protest in the first place. So that gives me a little bit of hope that Roger Goodell is, is signed sort of seeing the light. And he also um, reportedly gave his support, along with Doug Baldwin of the Seattle Seahawks, to um, a, me a letter to Congress about some measure of crime reform. Um, I'm not exactly sure of all the details, but he did put his name on a document in support of a crime reform bill. So, you know, I think he's, he's starting to lead by example. So maybe the owners will... Uh, join in and reports from the meeting between the players and the owners. It, I mean, I don't 
think anything really definitive has gone, you know, been set for, but there was a lot of dialogue and both sides seem to be really engaged. So we can hope that Roger Goodell is the person. I hope for everybody's sake that he is really up to this challenge. He's shown a couple signs that he might be moving in the right direction, but as of now, it's just a wait and see. Well, Keisha, we move on to the basketball world as the NBA gets ready for the 2017-2018 season. And NBA icon Michael Jordan is not happy with the state of the league. He thinks that the super team setup is hurtful and will get in the way of the NBA's growth. The six-time NBA champion and Hall of Famer stated, I think it's going to hurt the overall aspect of the league from a competitive standpoint. You're going to have one or two teams that are going to be great and another 28 teams that are going to be garbage, or they're going to have a tough time surviving in the business environment. Is Michael D Jordan delusional, or does he have a point? You know, I, gosh, super teams, there's been a lot of discussion about it, and I think last year, I think I was really down on the super teams because when Kevin Durant joined the Golden State Warriors, it just really seemed to be unfair. I watched that team just blow out some really quality teams on paper, but they, it was just not fun to really watch. And you just wanted to fast forward, at least I did, fast forward to the inevitable with the Warriors being in the playoffs and then obviously being in the finals. So, but I feel as though my attitude has shifted a little bit and I think a lot of it has, um, a lot of the moves in the offseason have kind of changed my perspective on super teams. Super teams, I think, either damage competition or they uh, create competition. And I think what super teams have done ha is challenge the general managers and coaches to really construct a team that can compete with the likes of a Golden State Warriors or the Cleveland Cavaliers out in the East. So, um, and to me, one of the biggest examples was Sam Presti of the Oklahoma City Thunder. He quietly has built a team that can legitimately compete with the Warriors. I don't think they're ready to overtake them as of now, but they really closed the gap. He, he acquired Paul George. He got rid of some players that were good, but he, Paul George is definitely an upgrade. And he got Carmelo Anthony. And if you remember, we talked a lot over the summer about Carmelo Anthony, and we really thought that he was going to be in New York for the preseason and for either part of the season or all of the season. And Carmelo had a very short list of teams that he was willing to lift his, for whom he was willing to uh, lift his no trade clause. And Oklahoma City was never a part of it. It was Houston. I think Cleveland was in the running. But then all of a sudden, here he is on OKC. And so I think what it's going to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge general managers to really put together these 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 teams and be really strategic about it. I think some of this comment by Michael Jordan, I think, uh, look, I'll, I'll get to what his comments were in a moment, but I think some of this is deflection. I think that this is one of the, probably the most competitive athlete in modern times that we've ever seen. And let's face it, the time that he's been spending in the front office with Charlotte has been a complete failure. And I'm not saying that he's setting himself up for excuse. And I'm not saying that it's been a complete failure where they haven't had, they have had some playoff teams, but it's almost as though he hears the critics saying, What's going on in the eight, nine, ten years that you've been with Charlotte and they have not been able to compete? Well, what happens in 2011? LeBron James goes over to Miami and it's so hard for some of these smaller market teams to compete at the same time. What Michael Jordan is saying as far as the super team stuff, uh, a lot of it I agree with. I think a lot of the regular season that we see throughout this reg throughout the NBA, a lot of it is just diluted. There's so many games that we get on Thursday night TNT where by the second quarter, the Golden State Warriors are already up by 25 points and we just wind up tuning out. As you pointed out, Keisha, though, this offseason I thought was key for the NBA as they move forward. We talked about the, You talked about the Houston Rockets, the Oklahoma City Thunder, a lot of these teams out in the Western Conference that made great moves to sort of go ahead and compete. And then, of course, look at the Boston Celtics. I think that it's a great time to be an NBA fan. Um, you know, not necessarily in New York. We'll get to the, our local teams later on in the show. But at the same time, you know, I thought after the NBA Finals, I was really down on the product that the NBA was putting out. But I, in agreeing with your point, I think that there's a lot to be excited for as we get ready for this season, not just some of these young players that are coming into the league, but I want to see how these players like Carmelo Anthony, a lot of these guys mix together. So it will be interesting to see how it all plays out. 
Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting, especially in the West. I'm literally excited for that. So we're gonna move from discussing super teams to talk about an owner who has a team that's anything but a super team. And that's Jacksonville Jaguars owner, Shad Khan, who recently did an interview with Crane Chicago Business in which he called out Donald Trump and his fellow NFL peers. Khan said that Trump is dividing Americans and conflating First Amendment rights with patriotism. Khan said in part, quote, you have to give Trump credit. People are confused on the First Amendment versus patriotism. That if you exercise your First Amendment, you're not, patri you're not a patriot, which is crazy, end quote. And of his NFL peers, he says, quote, you've got a bunch of 85-year-old guys who don't think they're racist, but they are racist, end quote. Now, for those of you who don't know, Khan is one of several owners that donated $1 million to Trump's campaign, which makes his comments a little bit interesting, puzzling for me. So, Mike, given Khan's comments and the state of, or his view of the state of the NFL, what do you think the NFL can do to kind of turn this around? Well, it certainly has its work cut out for him. As far as Khan's comments, uh, I completely agree with everything that he said about Donald Trump. But at the same time, weren't you the one that wound up supporting him? You know, and I think that there is a difference between going out and donating money to Trump's campaign prior to the election, prior to the whole process, as opposed to, well, there's also this story that he also donated to his inaugural committee, which means he was pro-Trump throughout the whole ride. So that makes me question some things about this guy's decisiveness. And as far as calling out the owners, I think whether or not there is truth to it, it is very troubling. The good news is, is that the people that he's calling out are in their mid-80s. These are people that are going to get shuffled away sooner than later. At the same time, I think that this really has to be concerning for a league which is predominantly African-American. Wait a second. You're telling me that these people that I'm playing for are bigots? I think that that's something that really puts a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, without a doubt. With Khan, though, I think there's a lot of indecisiveness that I see from this guy. A lot of the comments that he says, and it's not just because, okay, wait a second, you're the one who was supporting Trump, now you're anti-Trump. It's beyond that. I think at the same time, I look at this guy's perspective, he's this Pakistani American who came to this country in his mid-teens, wound up becoming a billionaire, so I think that the perspective that he has is completely different than 99% of the populations. At the same time, to finish off, just to finish with this, you know, the last comment I'll say, it's very troubling what Khan, Khan said about these owners. Yeah, I, his comments are really puzzling to me because campaign is all about raising money. And if you run out of money, then chances are you can't campaign anymore. And he donated, Khan donated to Trump's campaign, which got him further along in the process, donated, like you said, to the inaugural committee. So I don't understand. And as the only, to my, if my recollection is proper, He's the only minority owner in the NFL, and for him to have this kind of stance and, and also waver, but it's, it's kind of scary because, you know, at first you think it's the old white guy that is the problem at, in the NFL in terms of policies and how the players are being treated, but then you have a minority owner who is kind of rough, almost along the same lines. He... he initially connected with somebody whose ideology is really not for minorities and had Khan been born in a different time he may not have and Trump may have made, prevented him from coming over here and living this American dream so you know you did mention and I, I agree with you unfortunately I think that once these older owners start leaving this earth that you know the power the ownership tends to stay, in, to stay in the family. So hopefully, you know, with the passing of the power, you get a younger generation, a more progressive generation. You, you know, you don't want the, the son or the grandson who still has the same ideologies as the grandpa. But, you know, hopefully you can see that there will be that kind of shift. And I would also like to see the NFL have some more diversity programs that gives you know, pipelines to meaningful executive positions to minorities to, because I think that, you know, there's power. And power, when you have power and you have people who represent different walks of life making decisions, it, it's going to be um, 
it's going to make a world of difference. So we will see how the NFL starts to change if they change and I think you know what we talked about the NBA and how they seem to be more progressive it would be in the NFL's best interest to kind of move with the times but don't go away because when we come back we've got more to talk about traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light switch to energy saving bulbs saving energy saves you money Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Since we can't talk about everything for a long period of time, we're just going to give you a little quick bites to nibble on. Colin Kaepernick has filed an grievance against the NFL and its owners, citing collusion. Boston Celtics new cover Kyrie Irving seems to really enjoy Boston so far. While Irving was in Charlotte to play the Hornets, Kyrie, a New Jersey native, told the media, quote, it's exciting to be back on the East Coast. It's fast paced. A lot of different cultures, food, and people. You get it all, especially in Boston. And here is a feel-good story because we all need one in this, these days and times. Richard Sherman of the Seattle Seahawks drove from Seattle, Washington to Tacoma, Washington to bring gifts and visit with a preschool patient who Shermie Doll went missing. The patient carried her Shermie Doll wherever she went and unfortunately it was lost during her treatments. Needless to say, she was thrilled to have her real-life Shermie doll. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Dallas Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott is in limbo a little bit as of now. A federal appeals court lifted the injunction that prevented Ezekiel Elliott from serving his six-game suspension for allegations of domestic violence that was handed down by the NFL. As expected, the NFL reenacted its six-game suspension, but not so fast, NFL. The NFL Players Association filed a petition with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals asking for a full review of Elliott's case. So until the Fifth Court, I'm sorry, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals responds, Elliott is clear to play. Mike, do you think there will be 15 judges who will be willing to sit for this case? And also keep in mind, for the winning side, needs eight judges to agree. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, cases like this, you know, look, as far as Roger Goodell is concerned, he has an absurd amount of power. And a lot of cases like this, um, you know, it, it, it rare, these types of cases rarely get overturned. But what we've seen is a change in that in the NFL over the last several years. This whole situation with Ezekiel Elliott can make you dizzy, and I think that there's a lot of blame on every side, specifically with Ezekiel Elliott, who had this, who has these major, significant conduct issues. And then, of course, with the Dallas Cowboys and Jerry Jones and the way they've handled this whole situation, and then needless to say, the way that the NFL has gone out and issued this suspension. I think what it comes down to, I mean, look, the NFL issued a six-game suspension. My prediction is that that's what's going to wind up sticking. I don't see it getting reduced. I think in the long run, after all the appeals are said and done, I do think that um, Ezekiel Elliott is going to get the punishment. And you know what? He deserves it. It might be too excessive, but you know what? He deserves some type of, of repercussions for the way that this kid's been acting over the last several years. Well, I think all of this legal maneuvering is almost the equivalent to a stay of execution. At the end of the day, Ezekiel Elliott is going to serve that six-game suspension because there is not going to be a court that's going to want to overturn this because the punishment and Goodell's power was collectively a bargain for by both sides. The NFL players and ownership, they agreed to this to the collective bargaining agreement and in it it states the powers that Roger Goodell has and his power is broad and it is at his discretion so Ezekiel can fight this all he wants to and I think at some point I he might just need to lick his wounds and realize that he's not going to win this case well, Keisha, as a revenge over national anthem protests, a Las Vegas model, Kawana Nige, outs Miami Dolphins offensive line coach Chris Forrester, who videotaped himself snorting cocaine in his office in Miami. Once the video became public, Forrester and the Dolphins parted ways. Forrester issued a statement about getting help for his addiction and focusing on his family. Should the blame for Forrester's dismissal be with Kawana Nige, as most people are suggesting? It's easy to put the blame on her because she did release the video, but the blame is 
strictly and solely on Forrester. He put himself in this position. He was doing drugs at the office. He said in the video he was doing this drugs before the meeting. He was irresponsible. If he, and to me, he's the definition of reckless. Doing drugs at your job. I mean, I how can I even be sure that he had enough presence of mind to lock the door? Could you imagine somebody coming in just wanting to hand him a piece of paper and they walk into him in his office and snorting cocaine? Come on now. And then, you know, I don't think this was the first time he's done it. And I don't know, the, the Dolphins weren't, aren't doing so well this season. So, I mean, clearly, maybe he's not doing his job and we know why. The NBA and Nike are back together again. Nike is now the official apparel partner of the NBA. Here in New York at the NBA store, the league introduced the NBA Connected jerseys. Nike Connect uses a chip in the bottom of the official jerseys and fans can activate it by using their smartphones. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports? Well, Keisha, on to our New York sports report. And really, the toast of the Big Apple right now is the New York Yankees. They're in the midst of the American League Championship Series at the moment, trailing the Houston Astros. 2-1 to one in the series, and it looks like 4-2 to two right now at the moment of this taping in Game 4. So, Keisha, have you had a chance to tune into the Bronx Bombers? Well, a little bit, but uh, going through my social media, the Facebook, you know, my stream was full of Yankees and Aaron Judge and Joe Girardi and CeCe Sabathia. So there was a lot of excitement on Facebook, in the city. I felt a little bit of it. I'm still trying to get you to, you know, to put on that judge wig and robe and root on your team. I'm, I'm working on it, guys. He's a tough cookie, this one. But um, so hopefully we'll see how the Yankees will progress. And even if, you know, this ends right now, they've come a lot further than most people thought. And the future is looking bright for the Yankees with this young core that they have. Yeah, for me, the biggest story is they get ready for this October run. And though they've been in this October run, has been CC Sabathia. Here's a guy that's had his back against the wall the last couple of years. He's had great start after great start. It's been a lot of fun to watch. I mean, this is a guy that came to the Yankees almost 10 years ago now. And as he's getting into his late 30s, he's been able to adapt and show that he's probably got a couple of years left in the tank. He's a world champion, possible Hall of Fame candidate. And he has given the Yankees the ammunition that they meet, need to make this run. It's going to be awfully tough, though, as they try to come back against this Houston Astro team that won over 100 games this season. Very quick question for you, Mike. Joe Girardi, he stays or goes? He stays. Excellent. <laughs> well, we're going to move from the diamonds to the hardwood of the NBA and talk about our local heroes, the Brooklyn Nets. The Brooklyn Nets got a wake-up call in the last game of the preseason against the Philadelphia 76ers, where 76ers phenom Joel Embiid really exploited the Nets on the front court and on defense. Mike, what do you think that the Nets need to do going forward to um, effectively defend against somebody like a Joel Embiid? Well, for the Nets defensively, I think it's almost slim pickings, all right, because their roster, the way that it's shaped out, it's not going to be easy for them to play well defensively. I wish I could say Timothy Moskov is the answer, but we all know deep down that most likely he's not. I think that the acquisition of getting Damari Carroll in the offseason, now as far as him helping out with the front court, it's going to be tough. He's not necessarily as big as some of these other guys. But this is an NBA veteran. He does play pretty good defense. He's tough, playing on some winning teams, and he has a rapport with Kenny Atkinson. So I think that that's something that they can look forward to. Now, of course, he's not in the front court, but getting Rondé Hollis Jefferson back, as and if he can be healthy. I mean, he came in two years ago as a rookie. He was a stud the first couple of weeks before that horrible injury that he got. He was really played well defensively. Now, he's a backcourt guy, but at the same time, I think if he can kind of clamp down on some of the swingmen or some of the guards that he would have to it's going to make it a lot easier on the big bodies to go ahead and shut people down. Well, staying on the hardwood, Keisha, we go across the river, and now we talk about the New York Knicks. Most Knicks fans are really trying to reconcile in their minds that the Knicks are in complete rebuild mode. However, deep down inside, fans are still hoping that 
the orange and blue could have a winning season. Keisha, I ask you, when which Knicks player do you think could have a breakout season this year? And God forbid this team really does hit the skids. How safe is Jeff Hornacek's job security? Well, the player that better have a good season will be Kristaps Porzingis. He needs to be, you know, he needs to take his game up to maybe three levels. He, this is his team now. This, he is the face of this franchise. He needs to have a great breakout season. And hopefully, if he elevates his game, it'll bring everybody up with him and inspire them to, to lift up. I'm really interested in Willie Hernan Gomez. I really like him, and I'm really, really excited to see how he progresses over, you know, between last year and this year and even going forward. And, of course, my bias comes again with Jared Jack. I want him to have a great season. And as far as Jeff Hornacek is concerned, I don't know. It's really hard to say because you can give him an allowance now that Phil Jackson is going is gone because maybe there there was an idea that Phil Jackson really was meddling in Jeff Hornacek and impeding his ability to really coach this team. So Jeff Hornacek may have a, a year, a grace period, uh, but then again, they can cut the head off at the end of the season or during the season. So I wouldn't be so secure if I was Jeff, Jeff Hornacek, but I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him a little bit of leeway this season. You know, I think with the Knicks, I think that granted they've lost Carmelo Anthony, and it's going to be a big transition for a lot of these players on this roster who specifically look up to him, as we've mentioned with Lance Thomas a couple of weeks ago. We had that story. But I think at the same time, there might be a breath of fresh air because when you have a guy who's so dominant, who controls so much of the offense, who takes anywhere from 10 to 20 shots, 25 shots a game, now you let the other guys get into the flow of the offense. You give some other guys opportunities. Let's face it, for the Knicks, the ceiling is not that high. And as we pointed out with Jeff, Jeff Hornacek, we don't know what to expect. When you have James Dolan as an owner, I mean, your job security, really, it's really never safe. Uh, at the same time, I think that this is a chance for some of these younger players on the Knicks roster to maybe go ahead and, you know, I'll say this. Of course, I want to talk about Porzingis, but I think everything you said about him, you hit on the head. I think the guy that I'm really going to keep an eye on this season um, is Tim Hardaway Jr. You know, they went ahead, they got him, they made a big signing with the Atlanta Hawks, paying him good money, very good money. I like to see him try to you know, get back into New York, get back into the swing of things. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Wow, that, we had a lot to digest this show, and it has been really great. So we have to say goodbye. I don't like it. You know I don't, okay? You should know by now that I don't. 100 episodes, you should know by now. But don't worry, you can keep up with us again until we meet again by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson. On behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us at What's the 401, and we'll check you out again.